Welcome to Dreamers, Believers and High Achievers. My name is David C. Lee. Each episode, we bring you an inspiring person with an incredible message to help you turn your dreams into reality and unlock the high achiever within you. Thank you for spending some time with me today. And now off to the show. One time drug dealer, karate champion and entrepreneur who started a rehabilitation clinic with just $300 and later sold it for $45 million while successfully helping thousands to recover from drugs and alcohol and live happier, healthier lives. As you will find out, John just never stops learning and giving back to the community. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. John, you, you have a quote that uh, you often mention. Can you let us know what that is? Sure. I, I always like talking about this quote first because then I get into my story and you'll see how that melds into my life. So here it is. It's, it's from my book, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. Here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano, and I'm a recovering addict who turned $300 into $45 million. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. I wrote the book to help people, to show them for motivation, not about the money part. The money part, I don't even know how that happened. But it happened. <laughs> um, you know, the bottom line was, is that when I went, I, I didn't go to get help because I felt I needed it. Okay. I went to get help okay. because my family did an intervention on me. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, she'll never talk to me again. So I said, all right, I'll go to treatment. I had some Coke in my sock. I did a couple of hits and then I went into treatment. But let me... Diverse, let me go back a little bit and tell a little bit of my story, how we got to this point in time. Uh, I have a family that was a mafia-type family. My father was a heroin dealer. My uh, other family members were, uh, let's put it this way, uh, characters that did unsavory things. My uncle was a hitman. Matter of fact, my uncle, this is all in my book, by the way. Okay. My uncle, okay. Uh, through my wedding when I was 20, and the caterer insulted him in front of the family. And it was an interesting wedding. On one side, I was married to a Jewish girl whose father was a lawyer, mother was the head of the PTA. And my family, of course, my father was a heroin dealer, my uncle was a hitman, and the rest of the family did all kinds of various things. So on one side of the, the group, they had pens, and the other side, they had guns. That's how I always okay. say that. It was an interesting wedding, to say the least. So the caterer insulted my uncle in front of the family. So the next morning, of course, he killed him. And then my bride and I had to leave town rather rapidly because we got a call that the police were coming to my grandmother's house to arrest my uncle. So this is my part of my journey. Now, my other part of my journey, when I was eight, my father went to jail and uh, for four years. So I grew up without a dad for about four years. He came out of jail when I was 12. I got molested when I was eight and a half by some boys in the neighborhood. And it was very confusing for me because part of me liked it. And part of me thought it was shame and guilt and I was embarrassed and I hated myself. Then when I was nine, I got molested by my babysitter. She was 14. So I went to a priest and I asked him to get this devil out of me. And he says, okay, John, do a five Hero Marys, 10 Our Fathers, and you'll be fine. Well, mm. that didn't work too well. And I, 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 I went on this journey 
Uh, I got into gangs. There was in every gang known to man, a black gang, a Hispanic gang, Irish gang, Italian gang. I went on that trip, and then I wound up going to the martial arts, and that was another journey. And the reason I went to the martial arts was not because I wanted to learn karate, was because I wanted to beat up the instructor. <laughs> I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> so um, we were we were walking by this karate school, and I said, boy, I wonder how tough this guy really is. You know, because I was a street kid. I was a street yeah. fighter. So I thought I yeah. was, uh, you know, the toughest guy in the block. Well, so we went upstairs, and we were watching the class, waiting for it to end. And it got late, and I had to get home. Otherwise... My father, by then, was back from jail. He would hit me with the belt and send me to bed. So I went home. I told my dad I wanted to go to get karate classes. My mother didn't want me to. She was afraid I was going to get hurt. And my father said, no, he's going. And he talked my mother into it. But at the time, you had to be 15. Now, this is 1962. Mm -hmm. I'm 76 today. Okay, okay. So... um, I went, I was 14 and a half. Um, I had to get a letter from my folks to say it was okay for me to join. So we joined and I'm sitting around and I didn't know that there happened to be a jujitsu class, but I didn't really care. So I'm sitting around and they're teaching you how to fall and they was teaching different things. And then um, they sat us in a circle and the instructor, the small little guy with a round little belly and a round face was telling us about how to block a punch. And he says, any volunteers? And I says, oh, absolutely. (laughs) I volunteer. So as he was talking to the class, I tried to sneak punch him. I I advise you not to do that, by the way. Not another, not another bad idea. So I I threw the punch. All I know is I went from point A to point B. I was on the floor. I had a foot in my throat and I had a, (laughs) a little round face smiling at me. Well, let me tell you something. I fell in love with the martial arts. And I've been doing it for over 60-something years. So um, all I can tell you is that, you know, I became a karate champion, a jiu-jitsu champion, you know. Uh, I'm one of the top students in judo and jiu-jitsu. i metropolitan AAU judo champion. I put all my anger and all my stuff that I had inside of me, I put it into the martial arts. Uh, I became a national karate champ, black belt hall of fame. I'm in all that kind of stuff too. I started using drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs, anything when I was, you know, coming up when I was a teenager, I -hmm. drank a little bit. I used to get sick. So I never drank. Um, then when I got to karate, I didn't do anything. And, um, cause I was always training. What happened was I met, I moved to Florida when I was 17 and a half, met a girl and, you know, I was teaching karate at the Carolan Hotel on the sun deck there. Mm-hmm, I got mm-hmm. a school going, and uh, my students used to come stoned all the time. And I said, oh, oh, okay. So I worked them out till they threw up, and I figured, you know, that would straighten them out. They come to the next class, they did it again. Okay. I said, what is wrong with you people? Why do you need this stuff? You know, he's, oh, you should try it. I say, you never, you never did it. So yeah, okay, I don't need to do it. But what happened one day, my neighbor came up to my house and my apartment that I had and uh, said, he showed me this little vial of clear liquid. I said, what's that? Oh, that's LSD. I said, really? And I heard about this, how it expands your mind and how it, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, really? I said, let me see it. I opened it up and I drank the whole thing. Oh, no. I freaked out. And he says to me, Oh my God, do you know what you just did? He says, you drank five hits of LSD oh. for five oh. people. Well, I let me tell you something. I went on a journey for about four days. Oh, you day and night. I thought it would never end. And during that journey, for some reason, I don't even, still, till today, I don't understand. I told the guy, well, you know what? You look like a frog. I think I'm going to kill you. And then he said to me, oh, look at that light over there. And I went, oh. And then he changed my mind, and I went on this journey. And that's how I started my drug affair with drugs. Okay. So okay. I wind up doing psilocybin. I wind up doing mescaline. I wind up doing peyote. I wind up doing all the 
different drugs like that. Then I, mm-hmm. I started smoking pot and I started doing pills and I, you know, I, everything I learned about Eastern philosophies and meditation and doing all the right stuff, I just totally just put it aside and I went dancing around. And I always said it would never be like my family. And it wind up being just like my family. Mm-hmm. I wind up doing collection work for the smugglers. I wind up uh, selling drugs. Um, I mean, I did everything known to man that you're not supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. And I started to get, as, as what happens with drugs, it's really great in the beginning, and then uh, it turns on you. And uh, that's when I started to really get a little nuts. I was uh, doing all kinds of crazy things that you're not supposed to do. Okay. So my family did an intervention on me, and I told you who my family was, and I says, I wonder who's doing an intervention on them. <laughs> because my brother, my brother was part of it, and he was dealing drugs. My friends were dealing. You know, my whole family was, uh, you know, doing all kinds of nefarious things. And I'm saying, you guys are crazy. What, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. right, so I did a little bit too much one day. What's the big deal? You know, no, no, no. You got to go to treatment. So I said, okay. Right, so I went to treatment, all right? And I'm sitting in, and I'm wearing dark sunglasses and I go up to this Mount Sinai hospital and uh, I didn't want anybody to know who I was. This is how stupid I was. This is what drugs do to you. They really mm-hmm. make you suck up stupid. So, because I taught a lot of the nurses and doctors kids. So I didn't want anybody to know who I was. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. How do you hide behind a pair of sunglasses in the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, the kid comes up from the business office to talk about paying for treatment, and he happens to be one of my students. So I threw the glasses away. That was over with. Then I'm in group, and they tell me you have to share your secrets and your emotions in group. I said, look, man, if I do that, I'm going to have to beat the shit out of you or kill you. So anyway, they, you know, I, I I always have my bags packed. I, I I never unpack my bags in treatment. You know, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't even get. I used to say I wouldn't even get high with you people. You know, uh, I was very resistant. But what was happening was, as time went by, I started to clear up. The drugs started leaving my system, and I started to feel my emotions and the pain that I caused myself and my family. Okay, yeah. So yeah. that's when things started to get real. And those are the things that I was running away from. And they smack dab in your face. And that's what happens in treatment sometimes. So I remember then I started to loosen up and I started to want to, you know, share in group a little bit more and started to trust a little bit, not a lot, because, you know, street kids, we don't trust anybody. Yeah, yeah, coming people. from that background, for sure. So uh, I remember it was Christmas time. I went, uh, my clean date is December 4th. I'm coming up on 38 years in recovery. So let me tell Thank you me. people out there. Homie don't play, number one. And I'm not a, a, an idiot that would stick around with something that didn't make me feel good or didn't work. Mm-hmm. So if I'm in something for 38 years, you can bet that it made my life beyond my wildest dreams. And I remember I used to hear those sayings and I wanted to throw up, all right? But you want to know something? They were true. So anyway, I told them I want to go home for Christmas Eve. I didn't want my kids to see me in the hospital. So they said, you can't do it. Well, I don't know about anybody out there, but I, I, I didn't just get angry. I got rageful. And I ran back to my room. I punched the door. You know, threw stuff around my room. I was so angry, okay? And the really real reason why I wanted to go home was not to see my kids. My friends would come over with Christmas cards and give me some blow, some Coke. So, you know, anyway, I remember the counselor telling me in my head, he was talking, right? When he was talking to me, he was in my head now. And he said to me, John, you ever pray on your knees? I said, let me tell you something. I got calluses on my knees. I'm a recovering Catholic. So I says, what do you mean? God doesn't listen to me. How about if I'm standing in the closet? Will he hear me? You know, David, I was so out to lunch. You don't even realize how far gone you are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So 
Um, I don't know what happened. I just decided to let me, he says, how about for humility? You know, and that stuck in my head. So what I wind up doing was I try to get my knees down. Now, this may sound like baloney, but it's not. Okay, I couldn't okay. get my knee down. And I'm pushing my knee to get down. And I finally had to push my other knee to get down. And I believe for the first time in my life, I says, I don't know what's out there. God, Jesus, I don't know. But please, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Get this pain out of me. And let me tell you something, David. And I still feel that emotion. Uh, that emotion that it left. Okay. Now, I don't know about anybody else, man, but it never just left. Okay. Took me hours or days sometimes for that rage and that anger to leave. Mm, mm, and mm. What wound up happening was I call it a spiritual awakening. It was a turning point for me in treatment. So Coming up on the fourth week in treatment, we had to uh, do what is known as exiting. So exiting is when all the, th the therapists get together, the nurses, the doctors, and they put you in a room. It's very intimidating. And they talk to you about how you're doing in treatment, whether you need long-term treatment or extra treatment. And of course, I needed extra treatment, but that's another story. So <laughs> yeah. what wound up happening was I'm sitting in the room with all of them and they're going, oh, the doctor's saying, John really changed a lot. He's working on himself. He's sharing in group, but so do the other people say the same thing. And, you know, and the head doctor turned around, looked at me, and said, he's full of crap. Well, let me tell you. Well, you can well. take the kid out of the street, but you definitely can't take the street out of the kid. <laughs> I blew up on her and I called her every name in a book. I, and then I told him the most stupidest thing I could say, you know something? I could kill everybody in this room and you'll never get out of life. And the doctor turned around, one of the doctors says, John, all we want to do is help you. Well, I bursted out crying hysterical and I ran out of the room. And that was my real turning point in my recovery. So... All I can tell you is this. I was the one that was likely not to succeed, and here I am. And I, um, you know, I was married at the time, and they told me not to make any major decisions, and I listened to them. Matter of fact, they had to kick me out of aftercare. Aftercare was only a year. I stayed 16 months. You know, and my wife was still using. Matter of fact, when I got out of a treatment, uh, she hands me a vial of Coke and she says, hey, just do one line. You just you haven't had it in six weeks. I said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah. I said, forget it. You know, so I only have one white chip. I never had to go back to treatment. Mm -hmm, thank mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. uh, and my whole life changed. And eventually we got divorced. I became homeless because she got the house. She got the car. She got everything. Yeah. And a friend of mine loaned me a hotel room. I had a bicycle that somebody loaned me. I had a, a jar where I used to put quarters in when I had quarters. I no longer did collection work, and I no longer did um, uh, selling drugs. Mm -hmm. And I used to get calls constantly about, hey, John, can you turn me on to this? Hey, John, can you do a collection? I said, no, 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 no. And, you know, my kids used to come or all used to cry. They used to say, Daddy, why are you here? You know, all of this stuff. It was so painful. But I just kept going. And I wasn't the best of a student when it came to recovery. I, They told me, you know, you have to not go to the old places you go, you went to and not hang out with the old crew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I know these guys many years. And, you know, my friend owned a China club that was in South Beach. And I decided one day, look, man, I'm bored to hell. This recovery stuff is like, baloney, man. I don't know. I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to go back to that, but I'm just going to go see my friends. So I went over and I'm sitting in the nightclub and we're all talking and laughing and stuff and everybody's drinking. And I was never into drinking, so I didn't care. But all of a sudden they started one by one disappearing off the table and they're coming back with white powder under their nose. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, 
I'm getting really uncomfortable. I'm saying, you know something? I really understand what they're saying. I don't belong here. So I jump up and I say, fellas, I got to go. And I left. That was the last time I did that one. Okay. Then about four months into recovery, I'm broke as a joke. I keep getting calls. Uh, you know, I got a call. Some guy wanted uh, to get a couple of kilos of Coke. And he says, you don't have to touch anything. You don't do anything. Just give me the connection. Don't worry about it. You can have the money. I says, okay. So I called up the Colombians. We went to their house. They got a kilo on the table. And guys having, you know, all kinds of guns all around the place. And I'm looking at the Coke, and I go to touch it with my finger to taste it. And okay, yeah, it yeah. The water with some Clorox. And I went, what am I doing here to myself? Yeah, so I okay. jump up. Everybody goes for their guns. I said, no, no, no. Because they knew who I was. I said, I'm not here for any of that. You can give him the deal. I don't want anything. I went into my car. I sat there. I was drenched. I was sweating profusely mm-hmm. and shaking. And I couldn't believe how I felt. That was the last time I even went close to anything like that. Okay. So, you know, I tested the waters. It wasn't, that's not a good idea to test. Okay. Because most of us fail. I was fortunate. Yeah. yeah you're well done. Um, so well done. So, um, I wind up, you know, getting some idea. I don't want to tell the whole book because then they won't, you know, I want them to get the book because there's a lot to it. Anyway, my first couple of treatment centers that I opened up, um, I, a friend of mine gave me a quarter of a million dollars. I told him, I'd lied to him. I told him I had this famous doctor that wanted to open up a treatment center. I never even spoke to the doctor. He was my doctor. And I, anyway, I, he said, if you got him, I'll give you the money. I went to the doctor and... Later on, he decided that he wanted to do this, and we opened up the treatment center. I opened it up with my therapist, my doctor. Well, they only had a couple of years in recovery, and, you know, just because you stop drugs and alcohol doesn't mean you stop your behaviors. Long story short, I got beat out of my treatment center. Um, I only went to the ninth grade, so I had to go back and get my GED. And, you know, they took the inpatient part, they said, they'll just give me the outpatient part, okay? They, uh, the, the doctor had a sex addiction. Uh, we couldn't make payroll. And um, my other partner that put up the money said, John, they're stealing. I said, no, they're in recovery. They won't do that. I mean, I got sober to get stupid, okay? <laughs> Here I am, a street kid. They don't believe anybody. All of a sudden, I was under the ether. Anyway. I went into the office. I says, did, did you, are you stealing? So he says, put his head down. He says, you know, I got a sex addiction. I was buying apartments for girls and hookers. And, and that's where the money went. Now, my therapist didn't like the fact that his client was his boss. Meanwhile, I was so happy to give back to him for helping me save my life. But he didn't look at it that way. Anyway, long story short, they said that they were just going to change the corporation, get me out of it. Uh, then I had to sign over to the, the, the uh, company to them. And I was devastated. So that's what I did. And the street kid came out again, and I called my uncle up. I told him what was going on. He says, I'll be right there. I'll straighten this out right away. And I knew what he was going to do. And I changed my mind, and I called him up just before he left. I told him, no, no, we resolved everything. Uh, thank God. So those are the things that are some of the things that I went through horrifically. And anyway, I had to stay there because I needed 6,000 hours of supervision in order mm-hmm. to get my certification to be a certified addiction professional. And I needed 300 hours of schooling, which I did. Um, so I had to stay there and bite the bullet. They gave me the outpatient with three clients. And, <laughs> and you know, it was like it was going to fail. But I came up with another idea, how to make a total continuum of care. And anything that anybody went to inpatient would come to my outpatient. And, and there's a whole story how they try to get rid of me during the whole thing. And long story short, I finally got out uh, after threatening him after I got my, my uh, certification and stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, I wound up with $80,000. I told him, I walked into his office. I said, look, I'm going to rearrange your face. And nobody, no plastic surgeon is going to put it back together. I said, that's number one. Number two, I said, I'm calling up my uncle. Now, they knew who my uncle was because we had him in treatment. He, okay, had, okay. He, had a, he had a cocaine problem. All right? So I told him what he did, but nobody believed me, I guess. I thought it was embellishing things. So anyway, they come running out of the group room, the therapist, and says, your uncle, your uncle. I said, what did he do? What did he do? He's, he's telling us all the people he killed. I says, I told you what he did for a living. You know, so that was the story. So when I told him that, they gave me a contract within an hour. Okay. Because they were supposed to pay me a percentage, which I never got. Anyway, I went, and my friend that put up the money, they gave him the accounts receivables. He got his money back. And he said, look, I got another guy that wants to open up a treatment center. I said, okay. So he said, the guy wants a business plan. I says, I don't know how to write a business plan. He says, okay, I'll do it for you. So he writes the business plan. I give him the information. He writes the plan. So I go up to see this guy in West Palm Beach. I'm in Miami. Two minutes away, I forgot the business plan. Well, what am I going to do? I can't go back. I got to go forward. So I go forward. I tell the guy, the guy throws a napkin at me. And he says, here, write down what you need the money for. He says, I know all about you. So I wrote it down. He gave me a quarter of a million dollars. We opened up a, a treatment center. We had it for a year. I had my sponsor that I hired. Um, and... Here we are with this beautiful treatment center. Everything was going great. And he said, I'm going to fire you because I had a phone bill that was high. And I says, well, the reason I had a phone bill that was high because I'm in Miami getting patients. I brought in $70,000 worth of clients. Mm -hmm. You worried about a a $700 phone bill? (laughs) Exactly. So he looked at me and he says, well, that's too bad. You should read your contract. Now, I made the same mistake twice, by the way. Okay. Okay. I never had a lawyer. You see, in the street, somebody messes with you, take care of them a different way. Yeah. Right? Well, in, in, in the corporate world, you take care of it another way. And that's with lawyers. Well, I didn't have a lawyer for this one. He was right. I was going to throw him through a window. And my recovery kicked in. And I went to my sponsor. I says, come on, let's get out of here. I said, you don't know how to run this center. And he says, I can't leave. I just bought a house. So here I am, abandoned again. I went out to the parking lot with my box and my stuff. And I sat on my car crying. I couldn't believe this happened again. So here I am. Don't know what to do. Uh, I get a job offer at the place called The Better Way, which was a 55-bed indigent facility for uh, people that were homeless that had HIV. And they had comorbidity. They had uh, mental health issues and uh, substance abuse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it was an old, what is called a TC, therapeutic community. Uh, they would beat, they would tear you up, tear you down, put you in the middle of the room, and then try to build you back up. And I don't know about anybody else. I didn't need anybody. I didn't need anybody to tear me down. I did a good enough job on my own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most people do. Up. So uh, I didn't go for the way they were treating people. We would give them cakes and chocolates and stuff for lunchtime and. Uh, then they would act out with the sugar a half hour later. Then we would put them on a bench, all right, and put a, a sign around their neck. I mean, this was like stupid. Yeah. Very, so, yeah. so I says, you know, that's it. I resigned. And uh, the program director, you know, said, John, you got to get out of here. And I said, I'll resign. So I, I came up with this woman that I met, and uh, she said, Why don't you open up your own outpatient? I said, I don't want anything to do with treatment centers. She says, No, no, just use your own money. I said, My own money. I had a little spending addiction because there's more than just one addiction. Mm-hmm. And I only had $300 left in my bank account. My friend owned the building. It was 750 square feet. And I says, okay. So I go to him. I said, look, how much you want to rent the, this little space here? He says, how much you got? I said, be honest with you, Bill. I only have $300. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll take it. Run the place for about two or three months, get some money, and then you can start paying me. Well, okay. that's what I did. I hired a friend of mine. That I met in a better way. His name was Jerry. And uh, Jerry was really good at business. Me, he says, okay, let me see the books, John. I said, what books? I don't have any books. I said, well, how do you know them when they pay you? And eh, they give me the money. I put it in my pocket. They'll pay me. <laughs> don't worry. So he laughed and said, that's insane. So he <laughs> took over the business part. And then, you know, we 
just kept going and we started growing like crazy because I was doing things different than everybody else. I was looking at the whole person comprehensively. I wasn't just looking at them psychologically. A lot of them were vitamin deficient. A lot of them have they had their they had gut issues. And now it's finally out, and this is like twenty years ago. Mm, 20 yeah, years yeah, yeah. Now that now they call it the second brain. And that's where dopamine and serotonin is manufactured. That yeah. goes into the vagus, vagus nerve and goes into the and deposits the dopamine into your brain and serotonin. So if that's out of whack, everything else is going to be out of whack. Then I used a lot of the Eastern philosophies and the people I met along the way to help me and guide me through this process. So everybody used to laugh at me and say, oh, go to Giordano and give me a vitamin, he'll cure you. I wasn't saying that. I was just saying we need to look at people comprehensively. So I was saying, look, if you got low testosterone, you can have depression and anxiety or even high test. You're going to have depression and anxiety. I say, look it up. If you have leaky gut syndrome, H. pylori infection, those are gut issues. You can have depression and anxiety. I tell them, look it up. If you have hypoglycemia, you can have depression and anxiety. Low thyroid, depression and anxiety. Closed dead injuries, depression and anxiety, suicidal ideation, and behavioral problems. Heavy metal toxicity. You can have neurotransmission interruption, which mimics attention deficit disorder and bipolar disorder. So these are all the things that I told people about. And everybody looked at me like I was nuts. And, and this, was, this was 20 years ago, John? 20 years ago. Wow. I was so hard ahead of the... It was, it's, they still talk about me in, in the treatment centers and people that knew about my treatment center. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. we moved next door. Uh, I, I went over and, uh, you know, the woman didn't have it for sale. I went over and I says, and my partner says, John, we really don't have a lot of money. I said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll talk her into it. So, I, I went there and I told her I'll give her $25,000 more than what the place is worth. Uh, but she's got to hold a mortgage. Well, she did. And we had a new place now. And we just kept going. Then we got his son, my friend's son. And Gerald, he knew all about the internet. He was amazing. He was genius. And that's how we started to grow even further. But it took us a few years. We 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 always would give people treatment. Whether if they really wanted it, didn't have any money, we said, ah, sometimes you couldn't even make payroll. A lot of times we didn't go home with any money at all. And they had bill collectors chasing us. I mean, it was like like a comedy act. But as time went on, we built the treatment center and uh, we kept growing and growing. And then one of the a client's father, who was a multi, multi-millionaire, we, we saved his son's life and he bought us seven buildings. <laughs> now, we had to pay him back, yeah, all right, yeah. but he put the money up yeah, and yeah. we paid him every month and... But then what we did, we started doing research. I started meeting all kinds of scientists. I met Dr. Mash, who is a neuromolecular scientist from the University of Miami School of Medicine. She's mm -hmm. the one that really helped us to build our treatment center, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, Ibogaine, she's the leading expert on Ibogaine. Matter of fact, she's in England right now. They're doing this what, what they call the FDA trials because they call it a Schedule One drug here in the United States? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with Ibogaine? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, Ibogaine detoxes people in 24 to 36 hours from heroin, methadone, alcohol. It's an amazing substance when done properly, and I always say that term, when done properly, mm -hmm. because first of all, you'll have to do a medical on them. It has to be done in a medical supervision you have to see what drugs are on board. That's very important. Um, what the way we did it was, um, she would, we would do a heart monitor on them for 24 hours. We would do blood work. We would do toxicology. Then we would, if they were appropriate, we then we would send them to the island of St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. I would take them there, and um, then we would repeat tests on them. And then we would, uh, I would give them their intention, and I would help talk to about their traumas and things of that nature. 
before they went into their journey so it's fresh in their mind. Then we would put them in a hospital bed with a nurse by them with a heart, uh, a heart monitor on them with an IV in their arm just in case there was any kind of an event. Then we would give them a test dose to see how they tolerate it. And then if they did, in 45 minutes, we would give them a full dose. They would have eye shades on and a headset on with music to keep them in a containment field. They would go on to this dream state for about 8 to 10 to 12 hours, depending if they're a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer, and how their liver functioned. Then they would come out, and then I would help them to understand what they saw in their journey and help them. What they would have is what is known as a cathartic experience, which means they would have trauma resolution. Mm -hmm. It's an an incredible substance. And uh, that's how it started. See, MASH had a an ad that she put in when I first met her, uh, she was looking for test subjects. So I, I called her up and I says, I like to be one. And she says, no, 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 we don't need you. Well, six months later, she called me up and she says, Giordano, everywhere I go, I hear your name about holistic this, holistic that. Would you be interested in working with me? I said, absolutely. And that's how I learned about neuroscience, by the way, on the island okay. of St. There were neuroscientists that would come there. They would sit breakfast, lunch, and dinner talking about neuroscience. I thought they were talking Chinese. Now, remember, I only (laughs) went to the right phase. Yeah. yeah. So uh, eventually, I learned the language, and I understand, I understood a lot of the processes of the brain through them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was there like, what, 13 years? I think you had to learn something. Yeah, exactly. All right? So then I got uh, connected with Dr. Blum. He's the geneticist who found the addiction gene. And there is a gene for addiction. It's called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. And it's the main gene. There are other genes that are connected to it. Now, just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're going to become an addict. It means you're predisposed for addiction. Because there's such a thing as epigenetics which means the social environment can change the gene expression. Mm, mm. So these are some of the things I lecture about. I also lecture about hyperbaric medicine. That's oxygen under pressure. I also work with a Dr. Paul Harch, pioneer in hyperbaric medicine. He's the one that went to the Senate with Dr. Williamson, and they got them to approve wound healing for the VA for diabetics. Yeah, but yeah. It, they also found out that it works for TBI cases, traumatic brain injury cases. And when I usually do my lecture, I ask most of the doctors that I do the lecture, because I lecture at neuroscience conferences, I lecture to psychiatrists, psychologists, clinicians, researchers. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm currently in, by the way, 79 medical and scientific peer reviewed journals. Um, I work with 15 universities, uh, clinicians that go to 15 universities that are from universities. Um, it, it's my, my life has become like insane. And, and that's what I lecture about. And I lecture about co-contributing factors to addiction that we're not looking at and PTSD. But now yeah. I want to tell you what I just found. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Now, please do. Now, People that get knee injuries, back injuries, they get stuck on oxycodone, oxycontin. Right? They don't necessarily start off as an addict but become addicted mm-hmm. because these substances, after you take them for two, three weeks, they're highly addictive. And so what happens is they go to detox, we get them off the drugs, then we send them home, we tell them to stretch and do yoga, which helps, but it doesn't take the pain away. Yeah. And they go right back onto the meds and some of them die. So I found this thing called, and it's really wild, okay, the Atlas. Are you familiar with that, David, what the Atlas is? No, no, I'm not. So many of the things that you've touched on, they're, they're very cutting edge, the hyperbaric and those sort of things. And I'm really enthralled with uh, with what you're about to say, actually. I'm, oh, this stuff really uh, works, by the way. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. I have a friend of mine who's a lobbyist in Washington. Mm-hmm. And he says to me, hey, John, I got this guy who can get, I, I told him I have stenosis in my back from karate and I have a fused disc in my neck and my wife has a back back pain. And I said, you know, I got epidurals, I got ablation where they burn the nerves and, I, I, and mm-hmm. nothing works. 
So I just tolerate it. I don't take any pain meds. You know, it made me, I take Tylenol once in a while. So he says, no, no, this guy can get rid of that. I said, really? I said, well, what kind of guy is he? He says, he's a chiropractor. I said, hold on. Look, chiropractors are good. Some of them are, but look, I'm not going there three times a week. No, he says, no, one or two times you're done. I said, excuse okay. me? And then he says to me, I, I says, yeah, but, you know, the manipulation. No, he says, he doesn't touch you with his hands. Oh, he's a magician. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, John, you have to trust me. And I happen to know the guy for years, and I trust him. Mm -hmm. So I went there, and I'm asking him questions, of course, like any normal human being would ask. So he's telling me about this atlas. What the atlas is, it's the free-floating bone that's the top of your vertebrae that holds up your head. You know, they call okay. it the atlas because it holds up your head like the atlas holds up the world. Yeah, yeah. And what goes through the atlas, which is very interesting, I never even heard of this, even knew about this, is your inner carotid artery, which gives you the blood flow to your brain and to your optic nerve. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the atlas is your outer carotid artery, okay, that takes the toxins, the blood flow out of your brain with the toxins out. Mm -hmm. And it also, and the inside of the, the uh, atlas is your nerves that run through from your brain stem through your vertebrae all the way into your major organs. So when your atlas is out of alignment, okay, your body compensates and starts twisting in the same direction as your atlas. So okay. then you start having bulging disc. You start to have pain because you're pinching the nerves, right? So he explains all that. I said, yeah, okay, that sounds good, you know. So I had one leg was shorter than the other about, and about maybe a little, almost a half an inch. Because <laughs> when your muscles are in spasm, it's, it shortens your, your vertebrae, and then your leg gets shorter. And I used to limp, okay, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he asked me some questions, and then he sends me to get an X-ray of my neck. I get an X-ray, bring the CD back to him, and he looks at it, and the next morning we go to see him again. And out of the CD, he takes, he puts it into the computer, these calculations, and he uses this machine. And you lay on this table, and he puts this calculation in, and a little bar comes by your neck. It doesn't even touch your neck. And what he does, he sends a frequency to the atlas okay, to align it. And you hear a click, right? He says, you're done. I said, what do you mean I'm done? He says, you're done. He says, before you get off the table, he says to my wife, come around, look at his feet. So he picks up my feet and shows it. They're even. I get off the table. And David, this is no baloney. Okay, no more pain, and I'm not limping anymore. Wow. I said, what is this? So he does it to my wife. Same thing. So the next morning, right, was sitting in the hotel. I had to go back and see him that day. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading. And my wife goes, don't you need your glasses? I says, uh, uh, no. Now, I could see pretty good. But yep, sometimes yep. more print I can't see. I need my glasses. So I went back to him. I said, what is this? I, I, I can see a little better. He says, well, let me show you your x-ray. Well, on, in my particular case, my atlas was pinching the blood flow to my brain and to my optic nerve. Mm -hmm. Like a hose mm -hmm. gets crimped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By aligning it, that straightened out the hose and the blood flow. And it helps with depression, by the way, and PTSD, believe it or not. Okay. All right? And that's why I see a little bit because I get more blood flow to my optic nerve. And then he showed me how my middle of my neck was pinching my nerves running down my spinal cord and my outer, outer carotid artery. And by aligning it with this frequency, and I don't know if you see it, you ever see a sound wave hit water, how it ripples? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's what he does at a certain angle to realign your atlas. Then you have to wear this collar for about four hours to keep it in place. So it goes into its genetic predisposition. And then you're okay. Now, you can knock it out, okay? It's been eight yeah. months. I haven't knocked mine out. Okay. And my wife had some surgery, and they were twisting her neck around, so she knocked hers out. 
And so we're going back this week. But uh, all I can tell you people out there, you don't have to believe me, it's called epicclinics.com. Go look it up. It's in Clearwater, Florida. Please don't believe anything I tell you on this podcast. Okay, look it all up for yourself. Yeah, great advice. I always great tell great people advice. that. Yeah. You know, and then the second thing I found was ketamine, which I was against in the beginning because it was special K and everybody used to get high with it. Well, that was five years ago. Now I find out through the research and I found these two women who are anesthesiologists, incredible ladies that really care about people and they have a clinic and they run it so professional. I was so impressed. And my wife suffers from bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and uh, severe depression. Matter of fact, she tried to kill herself a few times and she's been in the hospital and mental health wards years and years ago. Um, she's been on like five medications and sometimes they work, then they don't work and change this, up this, lower that. You know, most people don't realize that these medications, SSRIs, Mayo and Hitters, that's Prozac, uh, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, all these drugs, they never were meant for long-term use. They only were meant for short-term intervention. And there's not that much research on cross-pollination of drugs. They're only educated guesses. Okay. That's why they can't give you a definitive answer of what works and what doesn't work. Only an educated answer. So she went through this process and she's almost off all her meds. She's got one med left and in about two weeks she's off of that. She's a completely different person. It was suppressing all her emotions. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you how much she changed is that we're both in shock. And then I've seen a bunch of people coming through here talking to them and finding out their experience is the same. So I bought into this company. They wanted me to buy in because they knew what I did. And what they do is, but see, all ketamine clinics are not the same. So I'm just going to tell you that up front. Some of the people just doing it to make money, we're not. Okay, money is a part of it, so we can keep going, of course. But yeah, of the course. bottom line is we do coaching. I do PTSD work with them. I do. We do counseling. We do group. We do nutraceutical IVs. We treat the gut. We treat the common causes of depression and anxiety and PTSD. So we don't just use ketamine is not a magic bullet. It's a good starting point. Okay. And when you start to feel depressed again or anxiety or PTSD, you come back and you get a booster. Some people come back in a month. Some come back in three months. Some people come back in a year. And some people don't come back at all. Everyone's different. So I've heard that, I've, I've heard so much about it. Never really dived into it and never had anybody explain it like you have, John. Well, you have to do it properly. You have to do intention. It's very important going in. You have to prepare yourself to go into this journey because it is a psychedelic journey, okay? And it brings up your traumas. Then you have to write about it, okay? You have to journal because that acts as another part of your brain. And then you have to go to counseling. Otherwise... You're just doing another quick fix that doesn't work. Of course. And they can go to my website, John, the initial J, Giordano, G-I-O-R-D-A-N-O dot com. You'll see some of the research in there, some of the podcasts. You'll see uh, some of the television shows, the radio shows, and just look up all the stuff in there. And uh, my phone number's on there. You can call uh, anytime it's on my books, my phone number, my other book, I, I have four books actually. And uh, my other book is, um, how to beat your addictions and live a quality life. And, um, the way I wrote that book is I interviewed, Oh, about a couple of hundred people that I felt had good recovery, not just quitting drugs and alcohol. Believe it or not. I know that nobody's going to believe that but that's the easy part. The hard part is living life on life's terms. Mm, mm, definitely. So when yeah. you learn how to deal with all that and learn how to change all these behaviors that you created and create new behaviors and a new mindset and a new confidence, okay? So I wanted to know what they did. Then I put that in the book. Then I interviewed about 100, 150 addicts, alcoholics, people with eating disorders, all kinds of different addictions. 
Okay, I wanted to know what they did and what they didn't do. Chronic relapsers. And I put that in the book, then I put my stuff in the book, and in the back of the book, you'll see a bunch of research. You can go and, you know, hit the button there and go check it out. So, you know, and, and what I'm doing with the ketamine clinic now, we're going to start doing research and um, outcome studies. So I'm really going to get in there so this way nobody can say, well, that's anecdotal. You know, all the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors that work for them, you know, yeah. they want to <laughs> yeah, they want to keep us, uh, uh, you know, moving around because we're like walking cash registers for them. They don't exactly. want us to get well. They just want us to do their drugs. So yeah. that's why I do these podcasts. That's why I do write these books. I mean, if you go on, you'll see the other books on there. All I can tell you guys, we're doing God's work. David's doing it. I'm doing it. A lot of other people. And I know nobody trusts what anybody says. Everybody has their own ideas of what is and what isn't. I always ask people when they come to me and say, well, how do I know this is going to work? I say, well, how's your way working? <laughs> yeah. That's the first question. Then I ask the second <laughs> question I ask, how well do you want to be? What are you willing to put into it? Because that's what you're going to get out of it. John, and I, that's it. I have, I, I just, this, what an incredible, incredible, incredible story. What an incredible conversation. I, I, I really salute you for everything that you've done, for what you have, uh, have overcome and so many people that you've helped. It's just an amazing story. I'm honored to, uh, to have you on the show. I'm honored to be on your show. And, you know, David, and, and, and I'm proud of people like you, and, and I know where you come from. And I know the pain and anguish, that emptiness, that anger, that loneliness, that why did it happen to me, and all this stuff that goes on with that. And look what you're doing, man. You're doing God's way, saving God's kids. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's really important. It's well, you're a little bit emotional here. I've got to thank you, John, for sharing so much of your life, sharing so much of your story. Uh, you've really unpacked it. You've left nothing, nothing hidden. You have really revealed your, your inner heart, your inner self. I just salute you for all the work you're doing. You know what I learned in life? I always used to try not, you know, try. I always used to not be vulnerable. That to me was weakness. You know what yeah. I learned? That's strength. Mm. Who doesn't have a power over me anymore. I would never tell you I only went to the ninth grade. I was never. I would never tell you I couldn't spell right. That's why I got a spell check, by the way. I would <laughs> never tell you any of these things. I got molested and part of me may have liked it. Never. Not anymore. Because that doesn't have power over me anymore. Yeah, and exactly. And I use it as a tool to help other people. Yeah, I think people people can really see authenticity. They can really appreciate authenticity. And, I mean, heck, you're walking around living a lie, then it's going to have an effect on you. It's going to have an effect on your psyche. It's going to have an effect on your relationships with other people. So, Absolutely. Yeah, just, just, just be authentic. Just wear your scars. Let, the, let, let them show. Let them show. It's full of fear. False evidence appearing run, appearing real, F-E-A-R. Yeah. And what yeah. most addicts do is they F everything and run. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I haven't heard that one. that one. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to have the links that you mentioned on the show notes and some of the absolute value gems that you shared with us today. Well, can you, uh, 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 the link that I would like also is the uh, uh, ketamine yep. uh, uh, clinic. Uh, it's uh, ketamine infusion clinic yep. of South Florida. It's in Pompano. Friends, we all have a choice, success or excuses. It's clearly your decision. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dreamers, Believers, and High Achievers. We hope you found today's discussion impactful. To help support the show and allow us to reach as many people as possible, we'd love if you could pass this along to at least two friends or family members to help them achieve greatness in their own lives. You can also visit davidclee.com for more information and resources to help you take your life to new heights, as well as connect with David directly on social media 